Uh, good afternoon uh, and welcome to the I-900 meeting for November 29th, uh, 2023, calling it to order. Uh, the purpose of this meeting uh, is for the state auditor to present their reports. Uh, the first one is Medicaid and managed care organizations, ensuring strong program integrity efforts and accurate encounter data. Uh, the second one is K-12 education during and after the pandemic, opportunities to learn from changes made in K-12 educational methods. Those are the two reports we will hear today. Chair will ask uh, all members and participants to mute their phones and their computers. Uh, so that we don't get any uh, interference or background noise. Uh, as members in the hearing room um, will keep uh, microphones off. I guess that's me. I'll be turning my microphone off when we have presentations. Uh, we're conducting this meeting uh, as a hybrid meeting. In-person participants are here in Senate hearing room four uh, in the Cherbourg building. Uh, and we also have virtual participants via Zoom. Uh, and it's also being streamed live on TVW. Uh, staff from the State Auditor's Office will give presentations of their recent performance audits. JLARC members attending virtually can let me know uh, during the presentations if they have questions uh, using the raise hand feature in Zoom. Uh, after uh, the SAO's uh, presentation, agency staff will uh, provide or be available to provide uh, comment on the audit reports and members will have an opportunity to ask them questions. Uh, we will be taking public testimony after each presentation. Uh, staff uh, supplied information on registering in person and remote public testimony via Zoom on the JLARC website. Written public testimony can be sent to JLARC at leg.wa.gov uh, and that is kind of a magical uh, Link there is leg.wa.gov. Uh, you can access just about anything legislative uh, using that link. Uh, but in this case, the uh, it's jlark at ledge.wa.gov. Um, and you can see the JLARC website for more information. Written testimony will be provided to JLARC members and available to the public on the JLARC website. Uh, and with that, let's launch into Medicaid and managed care organizations, ensuring strong program integrity efforts and accurate encounter data. Uh, and to present is Lori Gerritsen and Marissa Sanchez-Reed, who will be presenting uh, via Zoom. Welcome. Uh, excuse me, Chair. Um, do you want to do a, a roll call? We do have a few people online. Sure. Let's go ahead and do a roll call. Okay. Uh, Representative Alvarado. Representative Barnard. Representative Berg. Representative Fye. Representative Gaynor. Senator Hasegawa. Here. Senator Lovelett. Representative McClintock. Senator Mullet, Representative Orcutt. Present. Representative Paulette. Senator Rivers. Senator Solomon. Senator Short. Senator Wagoner. Senator Wilson. And I believe uh, Representative Barnard, you are correct. I thought I saw her on here earlier. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm here. Oh, I just okay. was having a hard time unmuting. Thanks. Oh, okay. Thank you. And Representative Paulette just snuck in behind you. And so Representative Paulette, so we have four in attendance. Thank you. Thank you. So let's now go to uh, Ms. Garrison and Sanchez Reed. Hi there. I am sharing my screen and I hope everyone can see it. There we go. I'm gonna get started. Thank you for taking time to hear about the Office of the Washington State Auditor's report on Medicaid and managed care as it relates to program integrity and accurate encounter data. 
My name is Marisa Sanchez Reed, and I'm a staff auditor who worked on the audit. Joining me today is Lori Ryman Garretson, who led the audit. We want to thank the healthcare authority and the managed care organizations for their time and responsiveness throughout the audit. During this audit, we found that NCOs took many key steps to prevent fraud and improve encounter data, but additional leading practices could strengthen these efforts. And HCA has strengthened oversight of MCO efforts, but could improve by including performance measures, verifying information MCOs supply, and incorporating formal processes for penalties. The bottom line is the MCOs and HCA have done a lot of good work. And we also identified some things that could be improved. Now I'll share why we did this audit. The audit is important because Medicaid covers a significant number of Washingtonians. And many of these enrollees received physical and behavioral health services through one of five managed care organizations. NCOs are private companies that provide healthcare services to eligible people in exchange for fixed monthly payments. In fiscal year 2022, managed care accounted for about half of all Medicaid spending, as roughly $9.7 billion was paid to the five MCOs. The amounts of these MCO payments are based on many factors, including program integrity efforts and encounter data. Program integrity refers to activities that ensure the right dollar amount is paid to the right provider for the right reason. This can include activities such as confirming whether services billed were actually delivered. These efforts are intended to prevent fraud and other improper payments so that taxpayer dollars are available for delivering necessary care. Encounter data are records of received services. This diagram demonstrates the flow of encounter data as it moves into the rate setting process. First, a provider sees a patient and records the visit. Then, the providers use that visit information to submit a claim to the MCO. After the MCO receives the claim, they process it. Then the MCO submits relevant claim information to HCA as a patient encounter. HCA validates encounter data from the MCOs and supplies it to the actuary. Finally, the actuary assesses the encounter data and sets premium rates for subsequent years. Now that we've covered encounter data, I'm gonna talk about our audit questions. During this audit, we answered two questions. The first relates to MCO program integrity efforts. The second relates to HCA and the MCOs providing accurate information to the actuary so it can be used as part of the rate setting process. To answer these questions, the audit focused on three of five MCOs. The MCOs we focused on were the Community Health Plan of Washington, Molina Healthcare, and United Healthcare, which serve three quarters of Washington's Medicaid clients. For the rest of the presentation, when Lori and I refer to the MCOs, we're talking about these three. Now let's move on to the audit results. During the audit, we found that the managed care organizations took many key steps to prevent fraud. For example, the MCOs had processes to identify providers who should not participate in Medicaid. And MCOs regularly verified whether patients received billed care. All three MCOs, MCOs used basic data analytics, such as identifying outliers that could indicate fraud or other improper payments. And two of the MCOs used advanced predictive analytics, which uses historical data to flag possibly fraudulent activity. However, program integrity efforts could be strengthened by applying additional data analytics that are recommended by leading practices. More information about data analytics is available in our report. Although HCA contracts did not require MCOs to conduct a full range of data analytics recommended by leading practices, two MCOs contracted with vendors for robust data analytic tools. However, we would like to note expectations that have not been made explicit in a contract are difficult to enforce. We just covered data analytics, and now I'm gonna talk about policies and procedures for overpayment recoveries. Federal and state law 
as well as HCA's contracts require MCOs to recover overpayments to providers and report on related activities. To ensure their employees meet these requirements, the MCO should establish procedures that clearly explain what staff are expected to do. During the audit, we found that all three MCOs were meeting these requirements. In addition to looking at procedures for overpayments and recoveries, we looked at the overpayment recovery reports MCOs submitted to HCA and the actuary. Leading practices advise verif verifying important data, preferably against source materials. Although HCA managers said they verified whether reported transactions were reflected in their system, HCA did not compare any of the transactions in the overpayment recovery reports with the information in the MCO system. This is important because when the audit team examined the overpayment recovery report, reports, we found some minor inaccuracies, such as mistyped data, duplications, and recoveries that had not actually occurred. Further, HCA did not verify that these reports included all of the information they were supposed to include. It is important that they contain complete and accurate information as these reports are one of many factors considered in the rate setting process. Now let's talk about MCO processes related to encounter data. The audit team reviewed MCO processes to ensure complete and accurate data, and we found that the MCOs met requirements and incorporated leading practices. For example, MCOs track provider submission issues and use the data to identify recurring patterns. The audit team also found that all three managed care organizations regularly reconciled their encounters to general ledgers, monitored processes to submit encounter data, and tracked and reviewed errors. During the audit period, one MCO conducted its own internal audits that compared, that compared claims to encounters. Retrospective audits that compare a sample of accepted and rejected encounters to their underlying claims are an effective way to ensure that any discrepancies are detected and corrected. It's worth noting that the other two MCOs said they intend to conduct similar internal audits in the future. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Lori to talk about HCA's oversight practices of the MCOs. Thank you, Marissa. And now we'd like to turn to the Healthcare Authority and its oversight of the MCO's program integrity efforts. As the state's Medicaid agency, the Healthcare Authority has strengthened its oversight of MCO program integrity efforts. This table shows an abbreviated list of program integrity practices that are in HCA's contracts with the MCOs. A more detailed table is available in our report. One requirement that we would highlight is that state law requires all state agencies to include consequences, such as penalties, in their contracts. And HCA's contracts with the MCOs do just that. As just one example, if HCA's Division of Program Integrity identifies overpayments that the MCOs did not identify, HCA can penalize the MCOs. While HCA has included many program integrity requirements in its contracts, during the audit period, HCA did not have any performance measures specific to program integrity in its contracts with the MCOs. HCA reports recently adding a minimum st standard for MCO improper payment recoveries to the contract. With that, HCA must report additional MCO program integrity measures to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Adding some or all of these performance measures to the contracts, together with associated benchmarks or targets, would strengthen HCA's authority should issues arise. Regarding HCA's oversight of MCO encounter data, which details all of the services received by people enrolled in Medicaid, as this table shows, HCA has many practices in place to ensure complete and accurate encounter data. Again, this is an abbreviated list with more details available in our report. One leading practice that we would highlight is HCA used multiple validation techniques as recommended by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. HCA used both automated system checks and it compared the encounter data to external information. External comparisons included federally required encounter data audits where HCA compared the encounter data it received with underlying claims. 
HCA also compared the encounter data it received with reported amounts from the MCO's general ledgers. However, one opportunity for improvement would be to request supporting documentation for these reported general ledger amounts. The HCA managers responsible for the comparison did not, did not request this type of documentation as they did not consider it to be within their role to do so. Finally, as in other situations, HCA can impose financial penalties against MCOs that do not meet encounter data obligations. However, the most clearly defined penalty lacked documented timelines and other penalties did not include specific triggers or amounts. Also, HCA lacked written guidance about when and how to impose these penalties, which could result in inconsistency. The full text of our recommendations is available in our report. In summary, we recommend some updates to the contracts, developing processes to verify the completeness and accuracy of some of the reported information, and formalizing the process for applying financial penalties related to potential issues with encounter data. That concludes our presentation, and we'd be happy to address any questions that you might have. So uh, while I'm waiting to see if any other members have questions, um, I will start off with one. Um, mm -hmm. And it's on um, one of the last slides uh, regarding the lack of documented policies for um, penalty for violations. Is that something that is uh, in that is allowed for them to do in statute or is there a statutory change that would need to be made in order for them to establish those uh, policies? So first I wanna be very specific. So we are talking about financial penalties for specific encounter data violations, and we are not aware of any statutory changes that would be needed. In fact, HCA reports that it is working on that at this time. So that is something that could be done through agency rulemaking rather than requiring legislative action. It would not require legislative action and it could be done within HCA. Okay, thank you. Uh, Absolutely. Do members have any questions? Not seeing any hands raised. Okay, so we have a few uh, individuals available from uh, the, HCA, the HCA as well as um, some of the some of the providers. So uh, if any of the providers would like to speak or if, uh, somebody from the HCA would like to speak, go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, also, please turn your camera on. Is anybody wishing to make any, any comments before we go to uh, member questions? Okay. Uh, Mr. Brown, would you like to make uh, a few comments? Thank you. <clears throat> um, the Healthcare Authority appreciates the work of the Auditor's Office and recognizes the importance of continuous improvement in this area. Uh, I just do, I do want to know we are meeting all the federal requirements for validating and ensuring all encounter data is accurate. Um, we believe our current actions promote the highest degree of accuracy. We're, we embrace all the opportunities for improvement and we're reviewing the additional recommendations from the auditor's office to determine the benefits of incorporating some of them into our existing processes. So, several of the recommendations may require additional resources to implement and so, uh, or software, and additional resources that we're reviewing to determine if we, if we have the necessary resources to implement them as well. And so, but but other than that, um, we we appreciate working with the um, the auditor's office. Uh, we have a good relationship with them, and and we look forward to continuing to work with them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do members have any questions for Mr. Brown? I'm not seeing any hands popping up. Um, so we have some. Uh, some of the providers uh, of the MCOs. Um, we have somebody for, we have Donna uh, Arcieri, uh, Grace Campbell, Mary Went, Scott Campbell, and Valerie Martinelik. Um, were any of you wanting to comment or provide any information? 
If so, please uh, use the raise hand feature and uh, turn on your camera. Not seeing anything. No further questions. Um, do we have public testimony? So we have no. So we have no public testimony at this time. So with that, uh, we'll thank you for the report, and we'll move on to our next report. And that will be K-12 education during and after the pandemic, opportunities to learn from changes made in K-12 educational methods. We have Emily Clymer and Renee Lewis from the State Auditor's Office, if they could um, turn on their cameras and unmute. Please proceed. Welcome. Thank you. Make sure everybody can see this here. All right, can everybody see that okay? Great, well good afternoon Chair and members of the committee. My name is Emily Simber, the lead on this audit and with me today is my colleague Renee Lewis. We are here to discuss the results from our performance audit looking at opportunities to learn from the changes that were made in K-12 educational methods during and after the pandemic. The pandemic's effect on the delivery of educational services and all of those concerned cannot be overstated. Um, students, their families, their teachers were all challenged by a sudden switch to online education and a need to do things differently while also balancing other numerous uncertainties and stresses in their personal lives. Um, in many cases, education did suffer. However, there are some creative practices that schools and districts described to deliver instruction outside traditional classrooms that are worth highlighting and may be worth retaining. And that's what we're here to discuss today. The COVID-19 pandemic prompted a cascade of change and upheaval in the education system, as well as the economy. While schools were forced to close, school districts were given significant flexibility in how they decided to ensure students could access education. Once vaccination rates increased, Washington schools began to return to in-person learning and flexibility around how to deliver education decreased. Some districts were no longer able to continue the new practices that they had implemented in the previous three years. Although many families and educators were not optimistic about remote learning when it began, a number of families have decided to continue with virtual or hybrid school. Some districts have chosen to keep online and alternative learning experience programs, as well as some other new practices that we will detail shortly. It should be noted that state funding structures pay districts more money for in-person students than online students, and the amount, of students receive, the amount that students receive per student is based on a complex formula that considers things like special education and low-income status. During the pandemic, however, the state adjusted funding rules temporarily to fund online students the same as in-person students. And many districts took advantage of the funding to develop new or expand existing online schools, provide devices and access to internet for students, among other projects. Funding rules have since returned to pre-pandemic structures and rates. We surveyed 11 districts across the state, as well as one charter school network, all identified by K-12 stakeholders as having implemented or expanded practices during the pandemic that could be useful to other districts. Some practices were in place in multiple districts we spoke with, but many were unique. For this audit, we sought to answer the following questions. What innovative practices have schools put into place to teach outside our traditional classroom environment? And how might schools incorporate these new modes of learning? With the flexibility afforded them due to the pandemic, districts seized the opportunity to tailor instruction to meet students' individual needs. One district we spoke with, Lynn Ritzville, did this through mastery-based learning in which students advance through content at their own pace, determined by when they master it and can demonstrate competency. The district's qualitative results showed improved classroom culture and participation among students, as well as greater job satisfaction among teachers. One of the most noticeable changes were the new online schools that districts had started during the pandemic. OSPI reported it approved dozens of new online programs in the 2020 and 21 and 21 22 school years. Walla Walla superintendent said that some students thrive so much online that about 200 wanted to continue online school after the return to in-person learning. 
Another creative practice was around the clock tutoring. Yakima started providing 24 seven tutoring for students during COVID because they noticed a lot of students were accessing materials later at night when Wi-Fi usage was lowest in the house. The district has continued this practice because it works so well. The dramatic expansion of online schools and at-home learning after March of 2020 meant most students suddenly needed access to a computer or similar device, plus access to the internet. Some districts ensured every student had access to a laptop or tablet computer. Several districts use innovative methods to provide internet access to students. For example, North Shore partnered with service providers to obtain discounted wireless internet hotspots. Yakima developed a district-wide wireless internet network. They did this by partnering with property owners all over town, placing mesh network Wi-Fi repeaters on top of the tallest buildings and trees across the whole district. And this allowed all students in the district to have broadband internet access. With so much about education being done differently during the pandemic, districts made significant efforts to engage students and families to keep them updated about changes. We heard that several districts saw increased parental attendance when districts conducted meetings over video. Some districts increased their efforts to communicate in languages other than English to better reach all of their students and families. For example, Federal Way used its website to provide information about coronavirus related resources and remote learning in the languages spoken at home by their students' families. Impact Public Schools held virtual town halls in four different languages using professional translators to share information and engage families. Impact also set up help desks to ensure families could get immediate technical support a few days ahead of any key changes. This allowed students to get used to the virtual classroom quickly and minimize frustration. As schools switched to remote learning, educators like their students faced a steep learning curve in using new technologies and tools. Districts had to find ways to train educators for teaching in a completely new environment and identified new ways to offer trainings to teachers. Some districts shared their expertise with each other via webinars and online training sessions. North Shore offered virtual and asynchronous professional development opportunities for their educators, which created a continued demand. An example of their success is their new Professionals Academy session for non teachers which is run after school and virtually. They said that they have more teachers participating in those sessions now than they ever did with in-person trainings. And finally, the pandemic also highlighted the importance of social and emotional learning for students, which has been identified as an area of growing need. So much so that a statewide effort was implemented in 52 districts across the state, aimed at expanding school-based behavioral health services in response to the increased student needs resulting from the pandemic. These interventions resulted in fewer discipline problems, reduced substance use, and greater self-awareness, including more self-regulation and asking for help. Several of the districts we talked to increased the attention they gave to students' social and emotional needs. For example, Bellevue School District's counselors began providing online services during the pandemic, and almost 90% of students receiving mental health services reported improved coping skills. In another example, Elma set up a school-based clinic that provides mental health services using a federal grant. The clinic in the small rural elementary school is the only one so far, but they hope to open another one in the future. The grant set up the infrastructure and they are using the student assistance program to implement the mental health services offered there. I'll now hand it over to Renee, who will tell you about some of the barriers that districts and other stakeholders shared with us. Thank you, Emily. I'm Renee Lewis and I'm a staff auditor on this audit. In addition to the creative practices that worked well, stakeholders also identified systemic barriers to districts maintaining these innovations for the long term. Those barriers included resistance to change and restrictions related to state requirements and funding. Stakeholders told us that meeting the needs of today's students requires the flexibility to do school differently. For example, structuring the school year in trimesters instead of semesters or using a year-round balanced calendar to prevent learning loss over the summer. Many people, from parents to educators, consider in-person learning the best, which sometimes contributes to negative perceptions of online learning. Educators may also resist changes that require them to learn new systems and technology when other responsibilities are not being taken off of their plates. Okay. 
The expectation for students to be in person in school all day without penalty to district funding is limiting. Both districts and state education associations agreed. To be funded under basic education funding formulas, students must be sitting in their seats in front of a teacher for a certain number of hours per day. This affects non-traditional programs where students are no longer sitting in classrooms or where they move forward after demonstrating competency. One district official said that administrators and counselors at small rural districts perform the same duties as their counterparts at larger districts, as well as other duties typically performed by additional personnel in larger districts. This can diminish the time rural administrators have available to research and implement new practices. A return to pre-pandemic funding calculations for students, which pay less for online students than in-person students, may mean some newly established online courses and programs could be shut down because they don't receive enough funding, even if they were well-liked by students and parents. In addition to the changes in basic, basic education state funding, temporary funding sources during COVID, including federal funding, have largely ended. District officials said that they are expected to run technology levies to raise funds for new devices, and devices purchased at the beginning of the pandemic are reaching the end of their recommended service life. They said they do not believe the state will provide funding for the equipment needed to continue their online programs. During the audit, we discussed our survey results with representatives from the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction and the Educational Service Districts to better understand what districts might be able to do locally to resolve the perceived barriers versus what might require action at the state level. OSPI said that the number of days and hours required in a school year are defined at the legislative level, but there is no specific requirement for what an individual district calendar looks like. OSPI said districts should consider developing alternative learning experience programs, which are more flexible than traditional classrooms. The debate over seat time-based funding versus competency-based funding is ongoing and will take several years in legislative involvement to attain the level of flexibility that districts want, OSPI said. Investment in devices and internet access to make non-traditional programs possible will require policymakers and stakeholders to decide if online education is equal to in-person education and then fund accordingly. <clears throat> this audit focused on capturing the non-traditional and creative approaches Washington educators employed during the pandemic and following years. For this reason, it makes no recommendations to any of the districts or educational service districts surveyed in the audit. We acknowledge again that education during the pandemic was very difficult for many people, educators, students, and parents. But despite the difficulties, we did find some positive examples to highlight as we've covered in this presentation and in our report. We consider the audit results so broadly applicable that it is in the state's best interest for all districts to consider implementing the practices highlighted in this report. In doing so, districts will also need to take into consideration current and future needs, available resources, and potential effects on students and educators. Thank you for listening to our presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I see that uh, Representative Pollitt has a question. If uh, members online have a question, uh, please use the raise hand feature and please turn on your cameras. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and um, I'm wondering if there was any examination or are you aware of any other examinations of uh, during and post-pandemic education outcomes and practices for children uh, with disabilities, and how did that play into their uh, experiences and outcomes played into this review at all. Hi there, yes, this is Emily. I can take that question. Um, I will say that generally student outcomes was something we discussed very early on with OSPI. 
say the long and short of it is that the data just wasn't there. Um, so more specifically, even looking for outcomes with those with disabilities, um, the same would apply. The pandemic years were such an anomaly for student testing and student outcomes data that there just wasn't enough to work with and the results would have been skewed. I do think that's something that could potentially be looked at in the future as we get more years of data uh, post pandemic and are able to compare that to pre pandemic outcomes. Um, and then looking at subgroups of that as well, especially with these newer hybrid or online models. Um, we heard anecdotally about positive outcomes, um, especially for, for some of those subgroups, um, but unfortunately the, the outcomes data just wasn't there to be able to, to look at from a quantitative way. Um, uh, were there, did you get to review um, innovative practices for working with children with specific disabilities, whether it uh, was autism or dyslexia or uh, other learning disabilities or any? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, it really wasn't something that we looked at specifically as part of this audit. Um, it was something we considered looking at, at subgroups, um, but we really kept it a little more broad than that for this audit. So un unfortunately, that's not something we were able to dive into. Thanks, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Senator Short. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there, there's been you know, a litany of information starting to come out on both testing of students, their their mastery of skills, you know, math and English and, and so forth, that, that show there's a pretty big disparity um, between what we're seeing today and the learning loss and, and you know, comparing that to pre-pandemic. Are, was that information you could use or it just wasn't, I, I'm just kind of wondering if that was something the auditor's office looked at in making this report? Um, unfortunately, it was not something that was really available to us at that time as we were doing our field work for this audit. I think that it, it could be potentially something that we look at in the future as we do have more information available, um, but, but not for this particular project, no. Senator Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you mentioned that there was um, some good outcomes uh, for on, online remote learning versus in the classroom. And some kids, they, a large group wanted to mm -hmm. continue with the remote. Is there a percentage there where, like, I haven't really heard much about that, that most of the time I hear it wasn't very, didn't work for many kids, most kids. So is there a percentage, like is it 90-10, that 90 in person and 10 remotely or? You know, I, th I think it's really district dependent. Um, a lot of the information that we received was very anecdotal. Um, there were a couple of districts they were able to quantify it to some extent. I think the one that I mentioned in the in the presentation, they said there were about 200 students in their pretty small district, which um, I'd have to do the math on that and see what the actual percentage of students was there. But I think it really varied district by district. And unfortunately, I think at this point in time anyway, a lot of this was just anecdotal and not even something that the districts were able to provide us um, specific numbers on. Yeah, that's what I've heard as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative Paulette. Thank you. I just uh, want to try to clarify something to follow up on Senator Wilson's question. The report mentioned uh, the drop in enrollment of, I think it was 38,000 as of this year compared to previously um, statewide, which is like three something percent um, only. Um, but do we? have any data on how many of those people enrolled in other non-public uh, school programs rather than uh, online or at home? Sure, and you know, I think this is something that I would have to um, get back to you on and check with OSPI, that data may be available. It's not something that we looked at for this audit, but it is something that I could follow up on. But it would be fair that out of that 38,000, 
um, we shouldn't assume that those 38,000 preferred online, they may have actually preferred in person and moved to schools that were operating earlier in person and stayed with them. That's correct. Thank you. Senator Short. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just kept thinking, and thank you for your response to my earlier question. Can you give us the timeline of, of when the auditor's office started undertaking the study? When did that get started? Sure, this was at the very beginning of this year, so January of 23. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, just to follow up, so you indicated that there wasn't data available on, on the testing, but yet you started the report the beginning of this year. Um, there was not data available before that time? on student testing? The data, sure, the data that, at least when we spoke with OSPI, the data that was available to, to them and to us was from the previous school year, um, and they told us that the results were very skewed because of the, the student testing or lack thereof during the pandemic, so there really wasn't much to go off of at that point um, compared to prior to the pandemic. Okay, any other questions? Do we have anybody on, any member online that's wishing to ask a question? Not seeing any hands. We don't have any agency representatives here uh, to testify or, or neither here nor online. Um, did we have somebody from the public signed up to testify? Yes, we have one person to, to testify. Okay, if they could come on and uh, unmute. And if you can identify yourself for the record, please. Yes, good afternoon, members of the committee. Can you see me and hear me okay? We can. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Jim Kokowski, and I retired uh, in June of 2022 after serving 23 years in our state as a superintendent the last 15 years in Davenport, and I currently serve and continue to serve as the director of the Rural Ed Center, and the Rural Ed Center is an organization made up of over 100 small rural schools from across the state. And I just wanted to share a few perspectives on the performance audit uh, report on K-12 education during after the pandemic. I, I have to admit, I just stumbled upon the report in this hearing uh, this morning, and I had a couple of other Zooms, so I apologize, it's not completely up to date. But I wanted to, um, to, again, just share some perspectives. Um, and I know that you know this, but uh, the, the report I did, does a pretty good job of capturing many of the issues, but I don't know if it really captures the true essence of how difficult it was uh, to operate a school district in during the pandemic uh, for all kinds of reasons. But, uh, and I know that uh, most of you probably know that, but, it, but I did, just don't think that that message should get lost. Um, I do appreciate that the performance audit identified 25 practices that were utilized to support students and their families. I do take some exception to the comment in the report that says smaller school districts in particular struggle to innovate with fewer staff. And I think that's a true statement, but I do think that our small and rural districts often are very innovative, even despite the fact having fewer staff to deal with challenges. And um, I, I wanted to make that point. I wanted to share very briefly uh, my district, Davenport, about a little over 500 kids, K-12. We, uh, we were closed in the spring like everybody else did, but we opened up that fall in September when many districts across the state were closed. And there were several other small and rural districts that did the same. And when you're small and rural, you can be a little more nimble and some, sometimes more very innovative, and you can quickly change. Our local district gave us the thumbs up and we implemented 10 kids to a teacher in pods of 10. We ran four bus routes, a morning route and an afternoon route. And uh, we worked really hard uh, to get our kids back in person because so many of our kids did, even though we had a pretty robust online component, many of our kids did not have broadband access. So that was very, very frustrating. And we found that many kids weren't turning work in. So we got them into school Again, with masking, screening, all that, all that work. Uh, but I think that that's a story that the report doesn't maybe capture. Uh, 
the the other thing that we found that once we got kids back in school, their their mental health seemed to get better, um, especially when we were able to offer some extracurricular, co-curricular activities, band, drama, sports. That made a tremendous difference. The, I'm, I'm perplexed as to why the report didn't have some recommendations, including the, maybe some of the following. Student mental health supports are greatly needed. And the trauma that many students and their families are dealing with that during COVID and following it has a tremendous impact on student learning. But even though schools are backed in person, and there is, again, many districts, as the report indicates, have an online offering, things are not back to normal in our schools. There are still a lot of families and kids suffering from the trauma of COVID. There also needs to be increased support for nursing services. And I, I'm surprised that that wasn't included in the report. Uh, the pandemic certainly showed that we, since it was a tremendous health issue that, uh, and as you, mo all of you know, um, it takes 5,000 students in a school to generate funding for a nurse. So our nursing services uh, need, need to be improved. Uh, I also was surprised that the report didn't explicitly recommend broadband access for all students and their families, regardless of if the family and students are choosing to do online uh, or not, that with the technology of today and the requirements uh, in the 21st century, our kids need to be very literate with technology. We were able to provide a uh, Chromebook to every one of our students because our community supported a capital project levy a few years earlier before the pandemic. So we were well set up for that. The challenge was the, the kids students could not have access, many of them to in these rural areas to uh, online learning. And the other thing I'm curious about is why the report didn't recommend continued incre and increasing support to our ESDs, educational service districts, and our local health districts, because they were instrumental in helping school districts uh, provide services during the pandemic. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and please know there's much more support and resources needed so our school districts can help meet the needs of our students so many of the innovative practices identified in the report can be implemented. Thank you very much. And thank you for jumping on. And I realize that you had a, a short amount of time and that there may be things that uh, you would like to add to after you get a chance to look at it. There is an opportunity for you to send in written comments. Uh, you can send them to jlark at ledge.wa.gov. Uh, so that's J-L-A-R-C at L-E-G dot W-A dot G-O-V. Um, I will turn to our presenters uh, yeah, Ms. Simber and Ms. Lewis to see if they wanted to um, respond to any of the, uh, the testimony that we re received. There may be some clarifications or there may be uh, some, some issues with the focus of it that wasn't broad enough to address some of these. Could you uh, please respond? Thank you. Sure, I'll try to address what I can. And thank you so much for your for your comments. Um, it's greatly appreciated. Um, I'll try to address a couple of the ones that um, that I have responses for. Um, I know that the smaller districts, the, the struggling with fewer staff and fewer resources, um, this was along with some of the other things that were brought up, just the perspective of those districts that we spoke with. You know, we can't speak for all districts in that regard. And I hope that that message didn't get lost, that innovation wasn't happening. It was happening. It just can be more challenging with fewer resources. Um, and I do want to be clear too that we certainly are not indicating with this report that these practices are what's best. Um, I think the, the struggle was real for probably the majority of students and teachers and parents and everybody involved. Um, some of these things worked for a subset of students. Uh, that's partly why we didn't make prescriptive recommendations to districts. Um, it can be difficult to make specific recommendations to all districts, especially when each has their own specific needs instead of resources. So this was really just meant to be, here are some practices that we can highlight that other districts may be able to borrow from. Um, and that's, that's really where this report was coming from. Um, but I, I really appreciate your insights and thank you. Oh, well, thank you, that was helpful. I did wanna quickly respond. I think it was Senator Paulette who asked about uh, students with special needs. We found that getting our, opening our school early is particularly for our special needs kids because many of them, just they just need the face-to-face. -face. They really, really uh, did much better once we got them in person. I don't know if that helps address his questions or not, but, but Emily, thank you for your feedback. I much appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, 
Um, are there any questions or final thoughts, comments? Uh, if not, I want to thank uh, all of our presenters and uh, the gentleman who just testified uh, for your input and for your work on both of these issues. Uh, and with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.